All right, welcome to Friends of Aquinas, episode three. And today I have the distinct honor of welcoming onto the show the Z Man from the Z Man blog. Thank you very much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. I, it was a little bit of a trial and error setting this up, but I'm happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, happy to have you here. And guys, if you, uh, I'm sure, I'm not sure if you are willing towards the end of the stream to kind of take questions from the audience if there are any. Oh, sure. No problem. Excellent. So if, Guys, there are links in the description and how, uh, detailing how you can send us your questions. And towards the end of the stream, we'll uh, both uh, Z-Man and I will will answer them, however they're addressed to you. So uh, this is kind of going to be in a cross because um, I, I live in the United Kingdom. I am interested in European politics and history, but I'm also interested in, of course, American history and politics because, and that that is something we can talk about definitely. My position is we've been occupied by America. Uh, in a sense that, uh, in, in every sense, really, we've been militaristically occupied, culturally occupied, technologically occupied, financially, whichever whichever uh, strand you take. I think uh, Europe has been kind of under the sphere of influence uh, of of the global American empire, and I think that's clear. So inevitably, we have to I have to discuss and look into American politics and American history, and you know, beside that, it's really very interesting also uh, because ultimately. Uh, I view America as a European civilization. I mean, its fundamentals uh, are European. Its native people are European. And so it's, in any case, very interesting to look at uh, at the civilization. So um, I, would you be able to, in that light, as we have many European viewers and obviously a lot of American viewers also, kind of give us a, a quick introduction of uh, who you are, what you do, uh, and so on? Sure. I've been, I've been writing... Well, I've had the site, I guess, for about 10 years. I've kind of lost track. And uh, I'm, my uh, you know, career was totally accidental. I used to be a guy that frequented the comment sections of nominally conservative websites, uh, usually as a critic. And one of them told me that uh, one of their moderators said that I was, I was the guy they feared, that the writers actually feared seeing in their comment section, which <laughs> made me laugh. But, uh, it, and what he suggested, he said, you know, you're, you're, people are coming here to read you and you're just giving, you know, you're giving the, uh, these guys a lot of help that you probably shouldn't be helping. You should start your own site. And that's, that's really the genesis of it. And I, I really was doing a conventional blogging thing, you know, where I'd copy and paste some text from a news story or something like that and then write some commentary. And that was fine. I didn't really, didn't really enjoy it a, a, that much. So I started tinkering around with just writing these short thousand word essays because I like doing that. that that seemed like a fun thing and amazingly enough I started getting an audience and I guess probably six seven years ago something like this is 2022 so six seven years ago I, I don't know exactly but uh, a college professor sent me an email and said you know you you really need to take this more seriously your essays are great the other stuff you should get rid of that Every, there's everybody's doing that stuff you can go on Twitter for that these short essays are, are really good and you really you know concentrate on that so I thought, what the heck? And sure enough, he was right. I started gaining an audience and I could see, you know, traffic picking up. It got to the point where I actually had to upgrade a, my server and, you know, things just kind of took off. And um, back in, oh, geez, around that same time, some Canadian guy, a radio guy, had asked me for an interview. And I'd never been interviewed before. I had no idea. I didn't know. I had the slightest idea how it worked. And so he walked me through setting up the software on my laptop and kind of mic to use and all this stuff. And, it was, it was a nice little primer on basic audio. And so I did the interview, and, and it was funny. People were amazed. They said I sounded completely different than they imagined I would sound. And that I had this radio voice, which I thought was funny. I never really <laughs> thought about my radio voice. But, uh, and, and people always joke around now, you know, they you know, tease me about the radio voice, especially friends who picked up on it. But I, so I started doing podcasts, and uh, sure enough, you know, it just it's one of those things I've just kind of done whatever I feel like doing. You know, my shows are, you know, I, I tend to follow a model for a while, then I get bored with it, and I change it up and do something different. But, you know, people like it, and um, and especially when I do single-topic stuff, people like that a lot. And I, I, there was a, uh, I, I, won't, I can't say who it is, but there's a, a fairly well-known academic in the United States who will send me suggestions sometimes, because they, because her argument is is that her graduate students are more likely to listen to some stranger on a podcast than listen to her. So, <laughs> so, so she'll give me a, 
you give me a subject and uh and I, you know we were all i was young once i understand how that works because yeah, there's a familiarity with listening to a podcast and you have a person's right in your ear and you're you know taking a walk or riding a bike or on a bus or whatever it is it's, it's something more intimate about it so i, I kind of get how that works but anyway you know it's, it's, i've wound up developing an audience and actually working on a book now and my, my audience is mostly american although i do have a i have strange audience in that i have uh i have a, a finnish lis- uh, listeners and, and readers i actually there's a fellow who will translate my stuff into finnish post that up on finnish um, websites i've had um i don't have as many uk listeners or canadian uh, readers as some i mean I, there's a probably a half a dozen or so commenters in my comment section or regulars who are from the uk um, but, uh, I have people of, of French readers, strangely enough, I, you know, you would think that that would, you know, cause they're French is probably the, eh, probably the country with the least amount of English speakers in uh, Europe, I guess, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and, um, uh, but, uh, you know, at times I've been in Europe, uh, French speakers will look me up and get together. I've, uh, I was in Copenhagen and wound up hanging around with some, uh, some French speakers. One was actually from Belgium. I got invited to some French thing during COVID. I couldn't make it because of the COVID restrictions for the uh, the French New Right guys. So it's an odd thing. You know, it's, it's, the internet makes the world a small place. And uh, I, I have a lot of Russian listeners. When I was in Russia, I was surprised how many Russian listeners. And because and, a fair amount of Russians have gone to school in the United States. Mm-hmm. Starting in the 90s, they could come to the U.S. This was an opportunity for them. There's all sorts of exchange programs. So there's a, a lot of English speakers in Russia. But... Uh, you know, English itself has become sort of this lingua franca of the world. You know, so uh, it, it's a it's a it's a neat thing, and in, in a way, I, I really I enjoy going to Europe. So it's even better when I can go there and and get together with people who have a similar interest, or listeners and readers. Well, uh, in a sense, I'm fulfilling both niches actually because uh, I do live in the UK and I have lived here for about twelve years. But my cultural and ethnic background is Russian, and I speak fluent Russian as well. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm fulfilling both of the niches that you've got there for your listeners and viewers. Um, and the way I've got uh, I've gotten onto you actually, the very first interview on uh, this channel is with uh, Paul Ramsey, uh, and uh, well, we spoke obviously about him. Uh, I think it was off air and. Um, uh, you're obviously familiar uh, with him. Are um kind of are you are you a fan of a fan of his? Do you communicate? I know he reads your blog all the time. So, what kind of relationship do you have with him? Well, we've never met. We've we've hmm. um, we we travel in the same circles. He, Paul used to do a lot of speaking in Europe, and I, I've been to a lot of these events, although not when he was there. Uh, gosh, he used to have maybe that was four or five years ago. He used to have Tina Wick. Well, she would pronounce it Vic. But anyway, she's Finnish, and he was a uh, her his uh, co-host, and uh, he had me on with her and, and her uh, well boyfriend, I guess, uh, Eunice, and uh, it was one of those funny things. All of a sudden, all these Finnish people started contacting me because I said nice things about Finland. I knew about the Winter War, and, and so, uh, and then when I, I of course I got invited to uh, Awakening in Finland and went to that a couple of times. So, so uh, you know, Paul has, has had me on. And, or four times, I think, something like that. And and because he has a, it's funny, he and I have a lot of overlap in terms of our, our view of the world. And we're similar ages. Um, and, you know, he, he, he was a, a technical guy. He was a computer programmer for a long time. I do math for a living. So, you know, we, we have very similar outlook. But we have different audiences because, you know, he's a, a really a YouTube pioneer. One of the first guys to do YouTube stuff. And, um, you know, he... he um, you know, he, he really, I mean, I would say probably the first YouTuber ever bothered watching. And uh, so I listen to his shows and uh, I know he listens to my stuff because I can tell, you know, it's funny. I'll get on, I have this habit. I'll kind of get onto something and I'll write about it quite a bit and talk about it. And mm-hmm. uh, and I can tell that he, he has recently listened to something of mine or what, read something of mine because he'll do something on it. So uh, there's a lot of cross-pollination there. But it, it's an interesting thing because there there is a, it, it, the gap between the audiences, live stream audiences are a different, really just a different uh, group than people who are listening to on-demand content like a podcast or certainly readers. My, my readership got mad at me when I started doing a podcast. They're like, why are you <laughs> wasting your time on this? You should be writing, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, it's it's good to kind of go back and forth. I, I'll probably never do podcasting. I mean, I'd never do a live streaming, but, because there's people out there who do it really well. You know, my, my view on things is that 
you should always find something that you can do well that needs to be done well mm-hmm. and then do that. and you know i'm i'm a i'm a writer with a very different sort of style and approach to things and not a lot of people are trying to fill that niche so i really do need to focus on that more and uh so that's what i do but uh, it's my primary thing yeah but my uh, podcast i do because it's fun i actually enjoy it it's you would think talking to yourself for an hour would be weird but uh it's actually a lot of fun because i get a lot of fun feedback from people so th- th- that's why i do that but um but yeah it's um i you know, so i i would say probably you're gonna put like, some sort of map of uh, politics around put paul and i in the same blob you know the of the a political ecosystem. Yeah, uh, just a couple of things uh, uh, that I wanted to address on the chat. If you expand the video description, there's going to be a link to uh, stream elements where you can uh, uh, donate and also ask questions. And uh, also, I just wanted to check if on the sound side, everything, the tech side, everything is good. So if anyone can pop a comment down in the live chat, that will be extremely useful. Uh, so actually, picking up on that, on uh, uh, what you've said. In terms of this the kind of overlapping and different uh, uh, overlapping the political sphere and the dissident right wing movements, uh, and on your style, actually, that's what I don't what I wanted to really talk about was, uh, and that's what really got me uh, kind of uh, interested in uh, interviewing you is uh, was your distinct style. It's exactly that I you know it, it, it's very old school from a Zoomer's perspective where you you know you just go on a website and read. An essay, ultimately. I mean, that is a very strange. That's not a. That's not very a Zoomer thing to do. As you have said, it's like a, a podcasting, live streaming, that kind of thing is popular these days. But what really attracted uh, amongst amongst you know the youth. But what really attracted me is this mature, analytical, uh, essayist approach that you have. So that's uh, that's something that I've enjoyed uh, whilst reading you. And as you say, the podcast is also pretty good. Kind of a stream of consciousness. Things things on. Um, your opinions on different topics, and I do. Uh, those listeners of mine who are not, uh, uh, who don't know about uh, the Z-Man, the few of you who don't, please go um, check him out at uh, thezman.com, if I'm not mistaken. And there is a lot yes. of a lot of great content there. My favorite content, probably my favorite page, and that's something we can elaborate on later, is the essential knowledge page. That 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 I think uh, deserves a, a special segment from us, uh, but. I'd like to talk about uh, something that I've read in one of your recent uh, essays or um, listened to in one of the recent podcasts. Maybe it wasn't recent. Maybe it was within a couple of months. Uh, But it's about dissident movements, dissident right-wing American movements. And I think this is especially poignant issue these days because... um, it's clear that gay, the global American empire, this this way of of, of ruling the world and this way of organizing society... It's, it's, its expiry date is approaching. Its expiry date is approaching, and the winter, as you've, you've, I think you've titled one of your recent essays, the, the, the winter of empire, or it may have been a podcast. Uh, but uh, in that light, in the light of basically gay ending, we need to think about alternatives. And uh, when I read about what you wrote with uh, on American dissidents. A name propped up that I see pop up in American dissident circles a lot, and that's Pat Buchanan. And I wanted to ask you, how do you assess Pat Buchanan's significance back on his, uh, back to, you know, to his uh, current uh, political movements at the time? And also, how do you assess his significance when it comes to any future right-wing dissident movements? Well, that's that's really good because I. I... I volunteered for Pat Buchanan back in the 1990s, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, something like that. So I was a young guy, probably your, your age group. We didn't. Uh, we were Xers, not Zoomers, but <laughs> and uh, it was it was fascinating then because I, I, we all thought, you know, you know, to kind of back up a little bit. When I was a younger man, a teenager, Reagan was president, right? And we mm-hmm. well, and Thatcher was prime minister. You know the the Iron Lady and and Ronald Reagan, the cowboy. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we're going to straighten the world out. You know, and and we really believed that our generation really genuinely believed that we were winning, we were going to win, and not only that, we were going to roll back the Cultural Revolution of the sixties, seventies, United States, and we would restore the country to something close to a normal country, win the Cold War, win the Cultural War. And, and restore normalcy. And of course, none of those things happened. I mean, the Cold War ended for sure, but that none of the cultural stuff happened. And in fact, things kind of got worse. And 
it was, I think for my generation, you probably hear this when you listen to Paul Ramsey, because he's, he talks about these things a lot too, is there's that sense of realism. And it comes from the Pat Buchanan experience. Pat Buchanan wasn't proposing anything that was really insane or radical. He was really talking about a, going back to normalcy. And that was considered to be scandalous and monstrous and, and Hitlerian. They compared Pat Buchanan to Hitler, which is crazy. And you know th that, I think, experience shaped a whole generation, my generation, probably a lot of millennials, what we call millennials here in the States, you know, the, the, those people. And uh, a lot of that sort of material, those ideas have kind of stuck around. And, and now we see Zoomers and our, you know, our context, uh, you know, the 20 somethings, early 20 somethings, these guys are, they're all finding this stuff. They're finding Pat Buchanan. They're finding Paul Godfrey. They're finding Joe Sobrin. They're finding all these old people. A lot of these guys are dead. And, uh, it, and so it's a, it's an odd legacy in a lot of ways. And, and that Cannon, I think not, he energized the generation, but that, gen that generation, we also became like monks in, in, in the sense that we were just preserving knowledge. That's really what we were doing. And I don't think it's just my generation. I think it's older people. Jared Taylor has talked about this, that his life work was basically to keep a record so that the future generations would have some knowledge that not everyone was insane back in this period. <laughs> and, and, and as a, but as a result, you know, I find myself as an old guy now dealing with younger people as this reserve of uh, information, you know, I, I, you can go to my site and quickly, because my essays are takes you too many. Like get a whole bunch of off ramps. You can go to a whole bunch of different places and, and go and, and find new stuff. You know, I, I try to really put in a lot of this stuff, mentioning old guys, old ideas, things like that for that purpose. So that someone who is younger or curious, or whatever, can say, Oh, let me, let me Google this. Let me find out about this. Let me learn more about this particular subject. And so I think in some odd way, Pat Buchanan, you know, even though his impact on politics was minimal, his long term, his shadow, you know, he's got this long shadow that's still there. I mean, Pat, look, mm. Donald Trump ran it basically as Pat Buchanan. And I mean, Pat, Brother Pat is, is um, you know, he, he's a saint. You know, I, I've joked about that after the, uh, after the revolution, we're going to knock down George Floyd statues, <laughs> that kind of stuff. We're going to put up Pat Buchanan statues. Uh, you know, but it, it's interesting enough, Pat Buchanan, and this is where like someone like me would break uh, with the paleocons, and that is, I don't think we can vote our way out of these problems. Mm. And I don't, I'm not very confident that we should be trying to vote our way out of these problems. I think, I think too many people are allowed to vote, frankly. And uh, we, we need to go back to this older understanding that there, there simply are, most people struggle to maintain their own lives. They struggle to do the basics and they should be left to do that. They shouldn't be asked to contribute to the conversation about war policy or economic policy. They're unqualified for that. And, and it's unfair to them to demand that they participate. And it's unfair to the rest of us that we cancel out our voice by, by allowing others to, um, who are unqualified to speak. So uh, the paleos and a guy like Pat Buchanan they wouldn't, certainly wouldn't agree with me on that. Interesting, because uh, and uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are on the SSPX. Uh, 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 fraternity, I mean. Uh, it's kind of, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, it's an offshoot of the Catholic Church post-Vatican II, post the Protestant reforms of the Catholic, that, has, that have hit the Catholic Church back in the 20th century. And I, uh, I myself am a supporter of the SSPX. And uh, there is a figure, really a father figure within the SSPX. Uh, his name was um, Archbishop Lefebvre. And so he uh, basically is to traditionalists, I think, uh, just like you've described Pat Buchanan when it comes to uh, conservatives, where uh, it kind of his generation, uh, you know, wasn't able to kind of achieve great political strives in terms of, you know, Pat Buchanan in, in American politics and the SSPX in, um, in the history of the church. But Thanks, uh, thankfully to Archbishop Lefebvre, we can go back and we have a lot of the traditionalist literature and uh, traditionalist thought that other otherwise would be totally destroyed by the new coming uh, liberal church. So in that sense, I think uh, I see a very kind of, uh, I see a strong parallel between the role of Pat Buchanan and the role of Archbishop Lefebvre in our kind of traditionalist Catholic circles. Are you familiar with the SSPX?
Oops, sorry about that. I, I muted myself by accident. Uh, that's the Society of St. Pius, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, uh, well, I, look, I went to Catholic school for 12 years, so uh, mm. Jesuits all the way through. So, uh, <laughs> oh, I've, uh, I've, I'm fortunate in that I have first-rate religious education, but, uh, you know, I, I do have a, a Jesuit bias, even though the Jesuits uh, don't always have the best reputation <laughs> and maybe haven't always done the best things. But, yeah, I, I think I, I think to some degree is that, you know, particularly people in my generation, and I've said this all the time, I particularly say it to young people, is that, you know, I'm not going to see the great change. I'm not going to see things, you know, the, I'm not going to see the promised land. I'm not going to live to see that. But I might be able to see the, 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 the you know, the ship turnings, you know, Western society finally turning back into the right direction. And, that, and that's enough. And, and what my generation needs to be able to do is just keep that, like little tugboats, keep uh, pushing the big ship in the right direction and helping, you know, so that future generations can can actually get the ship home. To continue the analogy, but uh, you know, that's that's really what what uh, your you, your role is sometimes. I mean, look, the Catholic Church largely did that through uh, you know the the late Roman Empire and mm -hmm. the uh, early Middle Ages. I mean, we, we wouldn't have. I mean, without the preservation of of Aristotle and the Greeks, I mean, we, what, what would, what would the West look like? I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, it, you know, Catholicism, uh, Hellenized Europe. I mean, that's really, mm. I think the way to think of it, you know? And, uh, you know, I mean, th th think about, you know, I have, like I've said this a million times, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm repeating myself a bit, but, you know, without the, the understanding that we live in a universe that operates by fixed and predictable rules, we don't have Western civilization. And, and we got that because of the church and because of the Greeks. And, and it was, you know, not put to very good use for what, a thousand years, but it was preserved. And, and, and once we had the great awakening and started to refine, uh, you know, refine ourselves again as, as Western people or European people, however you want to put it, that information was available. And sadly, not all of it. I mean, there's a lot of things that have been lost and, um, and, you know, I think all of us who have an interest in religion would would love for some great discovery of lost gospels, for example. You know, um, <laughs> that would that would change our understanding of the gospels. You know, and um, you know we wouldn't have to try and you know discern the Q document through um, you know analyzing the the language. But but you know, it, preserving information, preserving knowledge. That's an it's an important thing. It's a vital thing, and 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 even if it doesn't really serve my generation very well, you know, well, you just do the best you can. I mean, I I I will I will blink my last blink, happy enough knowing that that the, the fight is continuing and that I had some part in continuing the fight. So, you know, and and I think Pat Buchanan, I'm kind of circling back to him. I would bet he would say something similar to that. I mean, one of the things that I learned from Pat Buchanan, I think. Is that when back way way back then when I was a young guy, he treated young men like men. You, you talk to him, he would talk to you like an adult. And he wasn't the only guy that did that. I mean, there's a lot of these guys who do this. I met Steve King, is a congressman who was run out of Washington because he's uh, opposed to immigration, and he's he was in a room full of 1,500 Zoomers, and he's talking to them like they were fraternity brothers. And uh, and, he, and of course, the young guys you know like being talked. You know, you're a young man. You don't want to be treated like a child, and. Uh, and and that was that was definitely a Buchanan thing. You know, his generation believed in that. You know, once you were a man, you were in the club of men, and you get talked to like a man. And uh, and, and I, thankfully, I think a lot of my generation does the same thing. Yeah, Sue. Um, what do you think then? In that light, you were talking about how the Catholic Church has really Hellenized Europe, and I certainly see that. My view of the Catholic Church is it is really the last Roman institution after the destruction of Rome, and so, in in that sense, um, how do you <laughs> how do you deal with this? Um, oftentimes, you know, caricature that is being brought up by these Enlightenment liberal types to see that, uh, which say that well. Really, the Catholics hated Hellenism. They hated the pagans. They destroyed all the temples. They burnt all the, uh, all the all the uh, scriptures that were left by them. They really hated, they really hated uh, pagans and and the Roman Greek Roman world. And they really wanted to, you know. And that's what really plunged the world into these dark ages. What do you think of that uh, little historical caricature? 
Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's one of those things. It's uh, a, I think the term is gratuitous assertion. It's always been. It's funny. It's really since the the French Revolution, you have this anti-clerical, anti-Catholic element on the left. And, you know, in the United States, this wasn't a part of what we would think of as left-wing uh, politics until the 20th century. And it really started in really the first, say, quarter century of the 20th century. If you go back and listen to or read uh, left-wing Americans, or what we call left-wing Americans, progressives, they sounded like ministers. They sounded like, we, and because their language was salted with references to scripture, they, they sounded like religious reformers. And uh, that, that changed for a number of reasons, one of which is that you had a lot of Jewish people joining the, uh, the, the elites of the country in the beginning of the 20th century. And obviously you can't be uh, an overtly Christian movement when, uh, and, and also include uh, Jews in it. Mm -hmm. So there was some, I think, some consideration there. But also I think, you know, they, they began to become more radicalized too. But, but in Europe, that this anti-church, anti-religion thing has always really been there at the very beginning of what we think of as left-wing politics. Yeah. Certainly, you see it in the French Revolution, obviously. But, um, but Marx, you know, the Marxists, they, they, they looked at you know, uh, religion in general as this thing holding people back. You know, because, you know, they had that whole you know, Hegelian understanding of history. And uh, so, you know, uh, religion, particularly formal religion, Christianity was... Even Judaism, I mean, Marx, oddly enough, hated Jews, which was kind of amusing. <laughs> but, uh, but he, uh, but you know, they, they looked at religion, though, as this is really a, a, a hangover from the agricultural period, you know, the yep, agrarian yep. Uh, lifestyle, you know. So, um, so, it was, uh, you know, anti religion, but it's, 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 of course, it's the truth is, is that ideology simply supplanted religion. I mean, human mm. beings are believing machines, you know. I mean, look at the first things that we've built that we're all r r around religion. I mean, pastoral people built, uh, what is it, Gobi Tepe? I've always pronounced it wrong. It's in Turkey, modern day Turkey, you know, um, Asia Minor. Uh, it's it's the oldest man made site, and it's a religious site. You know, these, these, we hadn't even gotten to agriculture yet, where we were planting stuff. We were just herding animals, and people got together on a large scale to build a temple. And uh, you know, human beings are believing machines, and ideology has simply taken that. You know, taken the replacement, which is going to be interesting because you know, we, we at some point you said you know the end of the global American empire. Well, and it's also the end of liberal democracy as an ideology. So what's going to fill that? You know, we, we may very, very well be on the cusp of some great religious revival of some sort, mm. or perhaps some new religion to come along, you know, something that's, you know, appropriate for the age. Uh, you know, I, who, who knows, maybe we'll all be going to temple on, on, uh, in the metaverse or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but, uh, but you know something's going to have to fill fill the void. You know we we we're just we're just evolved to be believing machines, and it really makes a ton of sense when you stop and think about it. I mean, belief allows the containerization of complex abstract ideas, and, and so they can be transported from time and place. I mean, it really is probably the thing that makes humanity possible is belief. You know, because it allows us. You know. I can sit down and read a book that's two thousand years old, or obviously it's going to be a uh, uh, you know modern version of it. And that information, those co abstract concepts from some you know t time and place that's two thousand years away from me, I can have that. And, and why is that? Because most likely it's going to be something that's bound up in some sort of belief system, whether mm -hmm. it's Greek mythology, whether it's a religious text, or you know whatever. It's going to be tangled up in belief in some way. The person who wrote that wrote that down because fundamentally he's going to be motivated by, by belief in some way. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, um, so, I mean, you know, uh, uh how do, how do we get started on this? <laughs> um, <laughs> I gotta, gotta, yeah, it's one of the, one of the, 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 the uh, the odd, uh, things about, um, about doing these kinds of, of shows is that, uh, I, I'm the kind of guy who can definitely go off on a mm -hmm. tangent and, uh, you know, which is not always a bad thing, but, um, you know, if I get, if I go meandering on, don't, uh, you're not going to hurt my feelings by, by cutting me off. Uh, it, interesting that you say that because, um, uh, really when, uh, uh, Paul Rams introduced me to your writing, uh, and the way he described me to his, uh, listeners was that uh, I am a younger Z-man. That's literally what he said, and that's what interested <laughs> me in looking into you. And I have the exact same quality. I kind of start with one topic, and then that leads me to another. And by the end of the half an hour rant that I have, you know, I've totally wandered off. So I totally understand uh, where you're coming from, and I, I totally support that. I support, you know, going into the next 
universe uh, on a tangent. It's totally fine. Um, but well, on that... know, my writing style is actually based on this. I, I what mm -hmm. I figured out is that so I wouldn't I wouldn't have to spend three hours trying to write a, a an essay that takes two minutes to read. Is that I limit <laughs> my each paragraph to a certain number of words. And I try to stick to a 1,000 word limit because I, I really don't start out with a whole like concept in mind. I just start with this, I wake up whatever's on my mind and I start writing. But by having those, those rules in there, it kind of forces me to stay focused and, and uh, all right, I'm halfway through, so I have to wrap this up or don't bring that up because you'll go off on a tangent. You have to wrap it up. And that's really my writing style is entirely based on the fact that it's, it's the only way I can... Um, impose discipline on myself and uh, not write a, a 10,000 word essay when a thousand words is, do, is, is what I need. Yeah. Let me pick up on Christianity then. Um, what is the role, truly, truly, the role of Christianity in the traditional American founding identity? Well, it, it, there's actually a, a couple of pieces to it. You know, when the country, when the colonies were first founded, you had these uh, you know, the lunatics, uh, what we call Puritans. <laughs> I mean, these are people who couldn't get along with the Dutch. And the Dutch are the most accepting people on the planet. And they, they end up in a new world. And, you know, they build this new society. This, and that's a very, it, even to this day, New England is such a different place than the rest of America. You you can feel it. I mean, it, it's a, and I look, I lived there for a long time. So, you know, I've had some basis of comparison. So you have that, you have the Yankee New England which is this very public Protestant. There's, it's built on this belief that of communal salvation, you know, and, and it, look, this drives our politics to this day that, you know, one person causing trouble in a community can, can endanger the whole community. You know, there's one sinner in, in the group can, can bring, you know, can bring the, the devil into, into, the, uh, into the community. So you have that, but then you have this cavalier side. And, you know, the, the, the uh, English Revolution, the English Civil War, still plays a big part in American history. You have the other side, the cavalier side, where religion has a role, but it's much more of a private affair. And that, you know, there's, there's a, men have two lives. You, know, you have a public life and a private life. It's much more in the Southern tradition. And, and so you, you could have this, this sort of two thoughts in there. You, you could want to uphold public morality, but at the same time, turn a blind eye to the brothel on the edge of town, you know, th that kind of thing. And, you know, there's a, there's a much more, I think, a sort of complex view of the role of religion in life, and and is a, I think, a much more earthy understanding of of our of our nature as human beings. And th this con conflict is really what's driven American history. This sort of two views of things, uh, spiritual views, and of course, eventually the um, the North conquered the South in the Civil War, and has really run the country ever since. I mean, the rest of America. There's a there's a good book I always recommend. It's called. Um, American Nations. It's it's kind of like uh, the book. Um, uh, what the heck is it called? It's a English uh, written by an English guy. Um, well, I'll remember it in a second. But th what this book does, it's it's called American Nations, and and it breaks down the different cultural groups that settled in the colonies, settled in the New World, in North America, how they migrated south, and and, and points out things like uh, town names. You know, we have uh, Salem, Oregon, and and Salem, Massachusetts. Well, it's not an accident. The, the people who ended up sa settling in the American Northwest were people who came from the, the American Northeast. Uh, that's why you have similar uh, town names. You have similar voting patterns, educational patterns, uh, family formation is the same. I mean, these things all hold up. And what they say is that we're more than just you know, the stuff we buy, there's, our culture is tied to our biology. And you, it really does, you see this. And he actually has maps, which is really nice, that show this. And, and uh, you know, like a state like Indiana is, half of it is very much Appalachia, but the other half is very much like a Midwestern state. And, and if you go there, you see this, you're like, wow, these are, this, these are two entirely different cultures because they're different people. And they came from different parts of England. Uh, many cases, like, you know, some, some, some parts of the country have a lot of Scandinavian and German influence. And so, you, you know, this, this difference in our country, but the real driver, I think, is this sort of religious outlook that, that starts at the beginning. You have the public Protestant uh, Puritan view that says, you know, we, we, we're all judged communally. We're all judged together. We're, we've gone to constantly have to be rooting out our errors, our sin. And, and then the other side, it's much more accepting of the fact that, well, you can't save everyone, and the best you can do is live a good life. You have a personal relationship with Jesus, and you know, hope that works out. And you, we see this in our foreign policy right now. You know, the United States cannot tolerate 
what is going on in large parts of the world because we're dogmatically intolerant of anything but our view of of how to organize your society. I mean, it's a, our rulers to simply refuse to accept that there's different ways of doing things. And that goes back to the very founding of the country. I mean, they, you know, the Puritans were interesting guys, very educated, b- strong belief in education. Uh, what, 20 years after they landed, they built a university, Har- Harvard College. And, and that was to train uh, ministers. That was, their, that was the primary goal. And we still see this today with education in, in the United States. You're not there to learn something practical. You're, learn, you're there to learn values and morality and how to be a good citizen, that kind of thing. And, of course, now you, if you're a young person in college in the United States, you're pounded over the head with all the cultural stuff, the LGBTQ stuff and all that. And that's because that the, our, our educational model is not a practical model like the Germans would have. Ours is a completely moral model, and it, again, comes from the, um, the, the, the Puritan influence. So... You know, religion, you know, we don't, Catholicism has never really played a strong role in the, in the United States. I mean, we have a lot of Catholics for sure, but, um, it, it you know, you, you, you'll see, you know, Catholic influence in the law. There's a lot of Catholic lawyers, for example, Catholic judges, but in terms of elite opinion, it's still mm-hmm. in a lot of ways driven by those old Puritan impulses. And of course, you know, uh, Jews have a big influence on it too. There's a lot of crossover between Jewish sort of social reform and the old Puritan sense of social reform. There's a lot of uh, uh, overlap there. And, uh, and that's why I call it the Judeo-Puritan ruling elite, you know, because <laughs> they, they both kind of have a very similar worldview. Yep. And, uh, and, you, and of course, you, you talk to Jews. Uh, it's funny, Jews in America, you know, most, most Jews in America are pretty smart, obviously. And, and they, they'll tell you that. Yeah, I, when, I, when I use that phrase, Judeo-Puritan, they laugh because they, they know it's true. Yeah, I, uh, I think that... Um... In terms of uh, the Catholic influence, I mean, really what you've just said uh, kind of, I think, uh, reaffirms what uh, I believe, which is that ultimately speaking, um, you know, you at the very beginning of our conversation, we went back to kind of what are the roots of this progressivism. And, you you know, we went, you can go back centuries. Where I go back to all, always is the Reformation. And ultimately, my, my I'm of the opinion that uh, really Protestants are amongst the first leftists. I mean, ultimately that, and from, Protestant, from Protestantism in the coming centuries afterwards, uh, it's a direct evolution to liberalism. Uh, you know, the rejection of uh, Catholic uh, tradition, the, exact, the rejection of the practicality of the church. And, and uh, I think in, in that sense, um, America... Would you agree that in that sense, America was kind of uh, set up fundamentally as a very as almost like it's a modern liberal uh, state, and and in that sense, is it has always been kind of doomed to fail because it, it really I see it as a as a revolutionary child, right? It's 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 a revolutionary state, a liberal state, which uh, you know ultimately uh, can't you know can't really develop into. Um, something you know that's God-serving and that's stable and so on. What do you think of that? Yeah, no, I I, I would agree. Uh, particularly, you know, for Europeans, I think uh, the Protestant Revolution, Thirty Years' War, particularly, you know, that it, it broke that bond that that bond between the secular rulers and your spiritual guide. You know, that this this blend Listen, of the two things. Yeah, it's blended the two things. But the other thing it introduced is if you can sit down and open up this book and read it and have the same relationship with the supernatural as someone who has spent their life studying it, you know, this egalitarian view of religion, well, that makes the normal structure of society impossible because the normal structure of society is hierarchical. It has to be. It always has been. And, And what that introduced is this enormous internal conflict, this contradiction that can never be resolved. I mean, how can we have people in charge when in fact we are all equal? We're yeah. all, you know, in this egalitarian society. How can we have rich people and poor people? You know, and we're, we're shaking ourselves apart as Western people in, a, in an effort to try and reconcile things that are increasingly insane. I mean, the idea that a man with all of his capacities who puts on a, a woman's clothes and we're all required to pretend that he's a woman. I mean, that's just, that's madness. I mean, that's what that is. That's insanity. But that's what's happening though, because you can't reconcile these realities. If we're all equal in that, to that level in, in front of God, that ha- then of course, naturally, how come we're not equal to each other in, in, you know, in, in all ways? And, 
and that that you know the Catholic Church provided a, a framework for understanding this that you know this difference that these two things that seem like they're contradictory. How can we all be equal in the eyes of God, but at the same time not equal on earth? Well, the, the Church provided structure for that, and once you took that away, all those limits were gone. You know, that's it, that it's that limiting principle thing. You know, there has to be, you know, it, it, what Christianity always had provided was that you were. You were pious enough. You've done enough. You've reached this point where being any more faithful, being any more committed, th- th- gets you nothing more in return. So, you know, once you kind of reach this level, okay, you're a pious person. You're a good. You're you're in good standing with the church, whatever it might be. But once you you remove that set of rules, which are really arbitrary rules, and say, well, you know, every man can can now interact with scripture and come up with his own rules, his own limits. Well, now we're all in this contest, this piety contest. And that's what you see all over the West. Everybody's mm-hmm. trying to prove that they're more dedicated to whatever it is, these fads. Because let's face it, I mean, there are no Christian leaders in the West anymore, not in the United States, certainly not in Europe. I mean, I would be surprised. I would be surprised if there are any European leaders that actually go to services at all. Mm. I, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, if, if that, uh, the Algerian guy, uh, the, the, what's his name, Zenmore, if he wins, he would, <laughs> maybe he goes to the temple, I don't know. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> The closest yeah, I mean, he would yeah, get, you know, I think, is uh, Salvini. Although he's, uh, I don't think he no longer occupies, uh, you know, high government office. But I think that's as close as you would get. Yeah, but I mean, look, this this is the, the heart of the problem with what's going on between Russia and the West is that the Russians have kind of they've come through the other side. You know, there's a lot of parallels between liberal democracy and communism. Mm-hmm. It's a really amazing when you start looking at it. And and I think, you know, the Russians, particularly you know, just Eastern Europeans in general, they've gone through that. They've come out the other side and they're starting to start thinking about how to reconnect their spiritual and secular lives. And, uh, you know, the, the Orthodox Church is starting to play a greater role in Russian politics. Uh, not, you know, certainly not, you know, they know their place. But uh, Putin talks about these things. You know, you're starting to see almost, I wouldn't say a revival, but you can start to see the flickers of it. And, and I think it's because, you know, they, they went through that, that terrifying 70 years of communism, which we're, you know, we're experiencing now in, in some ways with liberal democracy, you know, this dogmatic intolerance and, um, you know, the inability to have structure, any kind of structure to society that's logical and rational, predictable, you know. And uh, so I think, um, you know, that, that's the real problem that you're seeing with the West. I mean, I, it's funny. I mean, I, I, I look, I know a lot about Russia because... I grew up in the Cold War, and you know we mm-hmm. learned about Russia and Russians. You know, you just became a thing. I've traveled to Russia. I mean, and uh, and and I, I make no bones about the fact my family came from Russia. So I mean, I have some sympathies for the Russians in a lot of ways culturally. But that's really one of the great things to start to see is this idea of the church actually being able to play a part in people's lives again. And uh, that doesn't exist in the West at all. Does that? Doesn't exist in the United States right now. Yeah, and yeah. and as a result, you know, it, it allows all this other stuff to run wild. Because let's face it, you know, if we if if we could pull out our Bible and say no, a man in a dress is, is it's immoral and unacceptable. Well, then there's no discussion. That's the end of it. You know, we, we've right, we solved that problem. Uh, there's no more debate to be had. Uh, it'll be maybe our, and our lives would be a lot simpler too. That, you know, that's the other thing mm-hmm. I think that you know the loss of religion makes life terribly complicated for most people. Yeah. Uh- on that, I think this was really, you provided there the key to understanding Western politics in a very simple way. And, you know, I think that really you look at conservatism today, you look at, you know, the republicanism, and you look at Democrats, the progressives. I really, uh, you know, uh, probably it was two or three years ago, I've come to the realization that really they come from the same intellectual tradition. They're really the same stock, you know, and you've just pointed out how much of a philosophical kind of commonality there is between uh, these kind of, you know, libertarian Republican types and the progressives. And ultimately that, I believe, comes from the fact that they share the fundamentals uh, the their fundamental values are individualistic values, and their values ultimately of harm prevention and things like that that are diametrically opposed to the traditional Christian European values. And really, to understand that, I think we have to go back to the French Revolution and really define what right wing and le- redefine what right right wing left wing uh, means in that 
context because that's i think in the future of american and european politics is going to be the definitions that play the key role and you've re uh, wrote about this in your essays as well that our definitions of left wing right right wing divide is really right now useless and i propose that actually what is going to be useful in the future are these original interpretations where on the right, there are the royalists, the traditionalists, the monarchists. And on the left, there are individualistic, kind of liberty-loving, you know, revolutionaries. And that is really, I think, the world that we keep on living in. And I think that um, that just a juxtaposition is only going to continue to gain relevance. Yeah, if you, if you look at the original structure of the American Constitution, it, it was largely written by and strongly influenced by the cavalier side. These were people who understood that you, you had to balance public good with individual liberty. And, and, and they understood that. And that, that's, that. The system was set up that way, is that we're going to have this balance. And that, yeah, that's going to mean that some communities in, in, in the United States, in the new country, are going to do things in a very different way than other communities. That, uh, and those other communities might not think they're very, very good. But only where they have commonalities, common interests, things like trade or war or something like that, will that ever matter? That, that was the dream. Because otherwise, they're able to live as, 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 they, as they choose. You know, America was largely founded, the constitutional structure was largely built on this assumption that we all have free association and that because I mean, it makes a lot of sense if you think about it i mean america was founded by people who said i don't like the old old world i don't like the old deal i'm going to come to this new place and i'm going to sign a new social contract i'm literally going to do that i mean for, for the social contract for americans it was actually a very real thing it still is I mean, we move around like crazy in this country we just hey mm. things aren't working out here don't have a great job you get the uh, moving trucks gone and you head off someplace else. I mean, Americans move a lot and it's because it's always been core to who we are is that, Hey, you know what? Those guys over there and in, in that part of the world, they're doing things the way they want. Best of luck to them. It's not working for me. I'm going to go over here where it does work for me. And I can, I can contribute to a, com a community in which I feel more comfortable. And that was really the, 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 the the ethos of the country. That was what it was based on. Free association, because it's a big country. I mean, we're still lightly populated compared to Europe. And we have lots of room. I mean, when I was a little kid, they had these shows on. Uh, and to, to kind of tell you how quickly things have changed, just in my own lifetime. When I was a little kid, they had these uh, shows on for kids or cartoons. And it's called uh, Schoolhouse Rock. You know, and you'd, you'd learn these different little things, you know, like your, the alphabet. And you'd learn uh, little, they did little musical ditties about how uh, uh, legislation was passed or whatever. But one of them was called Elbow Room, and it was all about how the United States is based on this idea that we don't want to get too crowded. We don't want to be around people who are like us. Well, then move someplace else. It was just that was just the way it was, and that's gone away. And the more big big problem we have in the United States is that this enforced association that goes on. Both, I think, it, it, uh, in the alternative reality of the internet, but also in our workplaces and in our communities. And, and that, that's become a, a huge problem for us, this enforced association. It's creating all kinds of conflicts. But, you know, this is a, you know, th this has always been kind of the, the, the original idea was, hey, we're going to have this balance. There are things that are for the common good we all have to do together. And then everything else, you're kind of left to your own communities and, and maybe even left to yourself as an individual. And that really has changed in the last century. Changes to the law, changes to legal reasoning. And has kind of forced us into this communal mindset, and and it's a weird thing because you know it's it's made America much more radical. You know, when you said that America is a radical country, it was really a, a radical concept for sure. But it, there, there's a sort of two phases to American. Uh, you know, there's the founding of the country, which would include the Revolutionary War and all that stuff, and the Constitution. But then you get the Civil War and the conquering of the rest of the country by the the Yankee elite. And they were genuinely the radicals. They were always the most radical. It's how they ended up in the new world because they, their, their radicalism was too much for the old world. And, and they have always been the sort of radical engine of American culture and, and policy. And, of course, now that America is a global empire, this radicalism is inflicted on everyone else and it, in really a horrible way. So, I mean, I'm, I'm stunned that Europeans are not berserkly anti-American. Yep. I, I, don't, I, I don't understand yep. how that's possible. Because, you know, I, I go to weird places in Europe to escape Americanism. 
Uh, that's I mean I, I you know but it's hard you know you can't I mean Paris mm. is, Maslow, I mean I I joke and I call Europe the provinces because you know it's all the same stuff you know it's the same junk yep, we have yep. I mean England the UK is you know it's just as bad and uh you know I, I, I my first time in Ireland I was shocked that you know every person I met in Ireland knew more about American politics than I did they paid attention <laughs> to it a lot more <laughs> you know, they wanted to talk about all this stuff I'm like well, I, look I live there I don't I don't care that much. And, um, but you know, it's, it's because of that, like you say, is there, you know, the, the radical project of America is to Americanize everyone, to homogenize yep. everyone, to turn everyone into a consumer. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I, it can't work. And I think that we're seeing that with Ukraine. I think we've, you know, you've seen, you know, the, the Roman empire, eventually the Rhine became the problem. You know, you couldn't go far beyond the Rhine. Um, and I think with, with for America, you can't go really far beyond that line that, distinguishes the West and Eurasia. You know, it's kind of hard. You know, where is the line? Is it Poland? Is it, uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's, there, there's a point there where you go from Western Europe to Eastern Europe, but, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a paradox because mm. no one can actually say, here's the line, you know. Yeah, I think that Eastern, Western European uh, thing can also be, unfortunately, uh, caught up in this inaccuracy of the Cold War, uh, you know, what, between the East and the West. It's a bit of a different dynamic when, when you talk about the, historically what is and ethnically and lingu linguistically what is Western and Eastern Europe, and then you have this relic of the Cold War. But really what you've been talking about is exactly what I mentioned uh, at the very beginning of our talk, is that uh, Europe is occupied. I've said that Europe is occupied, and I do feel, you know, I'm conducting an honest assessment of the, you know, how European people live, and we are occupied by these American moralizers. You know, I've said this on my previous videos and, and, and previous interviews that the only difference I see, I, I, call, I, I call the Europeans, you know, the young Europeans, new Americans. And uh, the reason is, is because uh, the only real difference uh, between Americans and these new young Europeans is the language. We still have, you know, and even then they they all speak English very well, by the way. So there's the superficial difference and, well, it's, it's a key difference, but nonetheless, they have this extra language that is based on whatever territory of this occupied, um, of these occupied provinces they happen to be birthed upon. Uh, and so, but that is really it. The others, you, you know, everything else is really derived from this American consumerist uh, kind of NATO, EU, UN, definitely in politics kind of culture. So I definitely, definitely agree with you there. And um, I, I kind of wanted to, uh, bringing it back to dissident right-wing right -wing movements, I want to give you a European kind of perspective, if you'd like, on really what I think is the only, the only energetic right-wing dissident movement right now, and that's Nicola J. Puentes and the Guipas. I really do not see any other credible um, political movement. And the reason is, is because I see that, uh, you know, they, to a certain point, at a certain point, they've outgrown their kind of online trolling movement. And they are now, uh, you know, they're now kind of being talked about in mainstream circles. They have congressmen uh, coming and talking to their events that, you know, the aim of uh, the leader of that movement is to ultimately penetrate the uh, mainstream and penetrate politics and American institutions. And the key to the philosophy of the movement and the reason why I'm, I'm so sympathetic and you could say Groeper adjacent to them is that they are, it can be summed up by something uh, that Nicola J. Puente said very recently, just a couple of days ago. You know, every single, almost every single thing that you can throw, criticism that you can throw at the Groepers comes from a 20, uh, you know, an, an enlightenment to the 21st century mindset. Uh, in in other words, twenty first century philosophy, and what he said was that we're not twenty first century philosophical movement. I am a twelfth century man, and this is really how how I I kind of became Groper adjacent. Really solidified my support for them because this is the man who understands that ultimately everything that's been happening, all the tor turmoil, effectively in Europe, uh, that's been happening over the past few centuries, is really. Um, kind of birthed from this uh, uh, liberalism, uh, the opposition to the church, the opposition to tradition and Christianity, and all these offshoots like communism, fascism, this pagan fascism stuff, and uh, liberal democracy, all of that stuff, they're just a variation on this liberalism. And so how do you assess then 
the work of Nic uh, Nicolas J. Fuentes, what do you think that the Groyper gang, does it have a future? Well, I met Nick, oh gosh, he was 19 at the time. So yeah, he was, I mean, he, he was really young at that point. And uh, he, he didn't have any, uh, any kind of traction at all. I mean, he was a little bit of a YouTuber, live streamer, that kind of thing. I mean, he'd been doing it for a couple of years. And he was an impressive young man. And, and I, I asked him, I said, he obviously, he being a young guy, he uses a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, salty language, maybe, uh, you know, uh, spices things up. And I asked him, I said, do you do this to get attention or do you think that that's, you know, that's what the impression you're trying to give people? And he gave me what I thought was an answer that I would have expected from a 40-year-old. And, and he had a remarkable degree of maturity. And, and I think he respected the hell out of asking him a question like an adult instead of treating him like a child. I, I, I get this. This comes up quite a bit in our scene is that, you know, older guys like me, old guys like me, who <laughs> are not who don't do the generational politics stuff. I mean, we, I mean, I don't mind the joking around, you know, the, the I've been on young guy shows, you know, they'll, they'll tease me about being a boomer and that kind of <laughs> stuff. But, uh, but you know, I can, I can give it back to, to, you know, I, I, there's nothing wrong with sort of that sort of fraternal sort of, uh, you know, back, back and forth. That That's a good thing. And, and it's healthy, but um, you know, but, but you know, he really struck me as how mature his answer was and how engaged he was with, with the conversation we're having, you know, because again, it was that, um, I, I guess that sense that, you know, cause there was a lot of older guys there at, at that event. And I think he, you know, he was kind of being treated like a boy and uh, watching from that point to now, I mean, I went to their last event. Uh, I went to his first event. I, I, I skipped the middle one because I had uh, business, uh, travel at the time, but then, um, but I went to the one in Florida, which was an amazing event. It was 1500 people in a room, uh, energy just, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, I've never been in an event with that much energy since the Buchanan days, really. Back then, you had that kind of energy. And he's all young guys. I mean, there's some old farts like me kicking around. But, um, you know, it's, it, it's amazing in a way because what he's been careful to do is to not have this 10-point plan, not have this, you know, he's vague, which is important. Political movements need to be cultural phenomena, not not a, a reform agenda, because I think in, in what the Zoomers are up to, and again, I mean, I, I'll give a little inside baseball here. I, I talked to quite a bit of these the people involved, including Fuentes, is that they understand that this is a cultural movement. It's not a political movement. It's a it's a counterculture. We're, we're developing a counterculture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Torba with uh, uh, the Gab site, he's gotten involved because what is he trying to do? He's promoting this idea of parallel society, parallel economics. We're going to build our stuff outside of you people because you, you know, the, the left, you know, you people, you can't behave yourself. You can't behave yourself like civilized people in a civilized society. So we're going to build our own parallel societies online. We're going to build our own communities in real life. And you're not allowed in, you know, <laughs> we're just not going to allow you in, you know, because our rules will prevent you from coming in and unless you acquiesce to the rules. And I really think that's what, what Fuentes is, understands better than anyone I've seen in 40 years of, of following this stuff. It, it was the, that was the thing that the Buchanan people got wrong. They, they, and I, I felt that back then. And, and I, I've, it's a lesson I've always carried, and I, I've written about this a lot, is that it has to be, you know, culture is what matters. Politics is downstream from culture. And, and you build a strong culture, and it has to be rooted in male fraternity, you know, this is a sort of an ancient European sense that mm -hmm. the, the male fraternity is the foundation of society. We get together, we do these things, we, we cooperate for our mutual protection to benefit our lives and all the other stuff you know, everybody knows about. And But when it comes to politics, it's a male-dominated thing, and it has a very masculine outlook, and it attracts other men to it who want to be a part of that kind of community, which inevitably will attract the kind of women that we want in our, our communities. You know, it's a rebuilding, and and but, but that's the only way it can work. We can't just go to the ballot box and say, "Hey, this guy won the election, and he's going to solve all these cultural problems." No, he's not, because politics are downstream from culture. We have to fix the culture first, and the politics will follow. And it doesn't really matter what kind of politics. If we got our culture in the United States straight, we got it fixed. We we could have a king. We, we'd have a dictator. It doesn't really matter because it, you know, the, the politics are going to be what the culture demands. Yeah, Joseph Damasio was right in that regard. We get the kind of government we deserve. And right now we have a terrible government, a lousy government run by evil people because our culture has been 
has collapsed. We, we are we, we are suffering from cultural collapse in the United States, and of course we we've, we've been kind enough to to give that cultural collapse to Europe as well. <laughs> and uh, you know, I mean, look, this is look my 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 uh, tacky post on Monday will actually touch on this, but but basically what we're seeing here is what Samuel Huntington talked about in the class the clash of civilizations. The Russians are drawing the line. Our civilization starts here. You will no got you will go no further, and. That, that's a that's a that's an important line. The Chinese are doing the same thing. They're getting ready to move the line from the middle of the Strait of Taiwan to the other side, to the to the east side of Taiwan, and say this is where this is our civilization, and um, and and that's not a bad thing. I think you know, um, we, we, I think the American Empire needs needs to uh, needs to be humiliated, and uh, because you know once that happens, the reform movements like the things that Fuentes is doing. Will get strength because people will look around and say, "Hey, wait a second! These guys no longer have credibility because they keep screwing up. They keep they're humiliating themselves, they're humiliating us, and so these our indigenous countercultural movements will get more followers, will get more credibility, and we'll also get smarter and better. I mean, we 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 always need better people. You know, you go to a Zoomer event here, and you see a lot of young guys who are in college or just out of college, but they do need some older guys around too. You know, you need some more of that. And right now the zoomers don't attract a lot of old guys because, you know, old guys kind of feel funny being around young guys <laughs> and, um, which is stupid. I mean, it's dumb, but, uh, I mean, I go there, I have a great time. I, I never, I, I've never felt out of place. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm definitely very much of Nick Fuente supporter, a Groper supporter. And, uh, I mean, look, I don't agree with him on everything. I think some of the things he's done are probably been, you know, maybe not as well thought out as it should be, but you know, that's just life. You know, I mean, we, yeah. no one's perfect. Everyone's going to make mistakes, especially for a young guy. I mean, this guy is doing things that no one else is doing. And there, guys are twice his age that complain about this stuff. They can't get 1,500 people in a room. They can't get 40,000 people to show up on a live stream. So, you know, until, until somebody comes along that's better than him, you know, he, he's the horse I'm riding. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. You have to, at the very, very least, appreciate the talent. The talent and the energy that this young man uh, uh, shows—it's—it's it's really something else. Um, and I think well, it's you know, really, when, when it's I was a, his age, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say when I was his age, I had a lot of stupid ideas in my head. <laughs> Everybody does when you're twenty. I mean, that's normal. I mean, if, if you didn't, there's something wrong with you, really. Uh, you know, you, you're supposed to have you're you know, it's, there's an old expression in America. You know, show me a a young man who's not left wing, and I'll show you a man without a heart. You show me <laughs> an old man who's left wing, and I'll show you a man without a brain. I mean. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's ideas and things that I had when I was a young man. Or I look back now and kind of cringe a little bit, but that's normal. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, you, you you spoke there about um, creating a parallel society, and that that led me to um, uh, this thought. So, the the falling apart of this global American empire. Uh, you know, there are two aspects to this, as I can see: the falling apart of the United States itself as a as a country, and then falling apart of its kind of international sphere of influence, like NATO and 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 maybe even you can you can bundle up the EU in that. But I, I want to focus on, on on domestics, and obviously this is really difficult. Uh, I mean, it's impossible to know, but I want to get your thoughts on the practicality of it. How do you think it will? What does that mean? fall apart? What does falling apart mean for America? Are we going to have a, a, a two different countries? You know, the kind of, are, are we going to have these lines of all drawn once again with, with the difference of the North and the South, the racial component, the religious component? How do you think that's all going to play out? Well, I, it's been my theory that the actual, the American empire domestically has been coming apart for probably 30 years. And I point out that I'm much more concerned about corporate power in my life than I am about government power. Uh, and, and you know, when I was a young guy first coming into the world, the government, uh, corporations feared government. They, they spent a lot of money, you know, uh, with lobbying and being friends of, of the government. Now it's the other way around, where corporations push around the government. And, and in a way, it, it's becoming, you know, a lot like uh, feudal Spain in that, these these new power centers, Silicon Valley, Wall Street, uh, Hollywood, the media, you know, the mass media, they, they're they're rising up 
to fill the void of, of a federal system that no longer really works. It's a, it's a weird evolution that happened is that the federal government accrued all this power to itself and in a way atrophied all the local government, but then the federal government is now failing to do basic things. And so you have who's in charge and, and really corporate America is starting to fill this place. They, they fill social structures now. I mean, people who work in big companies in America don't just go to work and come home. They have a, there's a social life attached to it. Their, their companies have weekend events and after work events and, you know, involved in charities and all this stuff. It, it's, you become almost identified with the, with the company. It, it's almost your, you know, your, your, your new identity, your new tribe. So I think that's been going on for a while, but I think the economic problems, I, we, this is very scary actually, because, you know, with the, the rest of the world now looking around saying that maybe we need an alternative to the dollar or at least a parallel currency. That's going to create real problems in America. We're going to get, we're going to get poor. I mean, look, you have, it, it's not just America. And Boris Johnson, I think recently came out and said something about that the, the UK is going to suffer its sharpest decline in living standards since we've ever measured these things because of energy costs and financial troubles and that sort of thing. And the same things are happening in America. And, and I, I don't, you know, Americans have had a really easy run. It's been it's been good times for a long time, and I don't know if we're equipped to handle bad times. And and that's that should be scary for the people in charge because, you know, that's that's where somebody uh, you know uh, the demagogues can come, come in and uh, and start to get attention. But I, I think we're just gonna we're gonna see we're gonna get poorer. I think the baby boom generation that's now retiring is going to be shocked that they're not going to have the retirement they expected. I think my generation is going to be very shocked by what's coming. Um, but millennials are really going to struggle with this the most. And, and we're, we're going to get poorer. And, and that's going to change how people view politics. It's going to change how they view the social arrangements, corporate arrangements. I think we're going to see a lot of class consciousness that we haven't had in a long time. We're going to start resenting rich people again, which is a good thing. Rich, rich, you know, look, there's nothing wrong with getting rich as long as you live in fear. Uh, you know, that's the trade-off. You know, um, you know, and because that keeps rich people in line, and and we haven't we haven't hanged any rich people lately, and that's that's a big mistake. You always have to hang one every once in a while to keep the rest in line. So I, I think you know we're, we're going to get much more class conscious. Um, I you know America's not going to go away. You know, I mean that's one of those things. It's not going to collapse. It's not going to you know we'll we'll just get poor. We'll have really difficult periods of social unrest. Um, but. You know, we'll, we'll be a different country, you know, because we're not going to be a 90% white country and, you know, ever again. So we'll, we'll have a different kind of politics. And, and I think, I hope is probably the best outcome could be is that we, re we return to the old way of managing a multicultural, multiracial society. And that is free association. We, we basically self-segregate and, um, you know, we, we kind of find our own place where we can be genuinely happy culturally. And uh, it might not be the same everywhere you know we'll get much more regional diversity again that's that's the that's the that's the positive side uh, the negative side is is that we you know the blm riots of two years ago were a foreshadowing of what comes next i don't know mm. all righty uh let's see uh what else i wanted to ask you uh let's Actually, um, I, I want to talk about Ukraine, obviously, and uh, I'm actually going to read, uh, uh, I want to thank Edward T. Uh, Nemechek, I think that's how you pronounce it, if not, I apologize, but he's uh, supported the stream, and his um, question is, um, you guys have any predictions for the Ukraine-Russia situation, how will it end? I have a feeling it will lead to a bigger conflict, but I hope I am wrong. Uh, Z-Man, I'll, I'll let you go first on this. Yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, I, I always tell people that look, my, my grandparents came from St. Petersburg. I've always had a fascination with Russia. Um, that that can lead to me to have a bias, and so I'm always conscious of that. I try to, um, you know, I try to, to to correct for it. But you know, the math is obvious. The Russians have more stuff. They have more soldiers. They're a more powerful country. Uh, they they've now. Uh, they're occupying, uh, the, as far as in Ukraine, the amount of land that's roughly the equivalent of the UK. It's an enormous amount of land that they've taken. Um, you know, in the next month, the Ukrainian army in the east will have a choice. It either, well, probably in the next week or two, they either surrender or they're obliterated. And um, 
you know, this is, you know, if you want to see what the Russians are doing, read about the Battle of Stalingrad, uh, the, 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 the cauldron or the Kessel, as the Germans called it. Russians are doing exactly the same thing. The Russians have been using the same tactics since Peter the Great. So, you know, they're, they're um, you know, that's what's going to happen. The eastern, you know, east of the Dnieper River is going to be free of the Ukrainian government. It's already starting to happen. They're introducing the ruble. They're introducing civil society. That's what's going to happen. Whether it's negotiated or whether it's by, you know, by, by force, and I got, that's, that's what we'll find out in the next month. But I think once the Russians get to that point, that's it. Um, it well, the big question is whether the West, whether Washington continues to prop up Zelensky. Um, I, I think that it's funny. I think the Russian side will be a lot more, a, a lot more uh, simple. I think the, the real question is what happens when there is a partition of Ukraine, you know, if it's not done via negotiation. Uh, which I, I think Washington doesn't want to allow Zelensky to sign off. Because, I mean, they think about it. If Zelensky signs that piece of paper, that legitimizes all this stuff. And so the, all the sanctions have to go away. All this stuff has to end. So Washington's mm -hmm. probably pushing to avoid that. But I do think that the ultra-nationalists will probably try and kill Zelensky at some point. If he's still in the country, I, I kind of doubt. I think he's probably in Poland. But um, but that, that thing's going to get really strange. Because, you know, you've got some weird things going on there. You've got the, uh, you know, the, the uh, Transcarpathian problem. Uh, you know, the Carpathian Rus who don't want to be a part of Ukraine. Uh, you have Lviv that used to be a part of Poland. <laughs> I mean, th things get very interesting for the, the NATO countries uh, because they didn't think this thing through. But I think, on the, you know, the, in the short term, you know, I, you know, the Russians will defeat the Ukrainian army in the east. Uh, whether or not they'll take Kiev, I kind of think they might not. I think they might say, well, we've done enough and we're just going to keep what we have. And, and, um, and then after that, I don't know. I think I don't think Washington thought it through. I mean, how could they have? I mean, how how did they get to this mess? I mean, there was no reason for this. I mean, you know, there's 10 million Ukrainian people who are being displaced right now because of idiocy. And uh, you know, I I, I just I, I don't I, I don't think you can predict people who are apparently com I mean completely ignorant of history. I mean, I, you know, granted this is a weird hobby of mine, but. People who are professionals in the State Department of the United States should know about the history of Ukraine. <laughs> they should know this stuff, <laughs> and uh, and they don't. They don't seem to know it, and I, and I find stunning in a way. I mean, you know, look, you you was it is a the UK ambassador to Russia didn't she didn't know that the Baltics were she thought the Baltics were on the Black Sea or something like that, <laughs> um, you know. So I mean. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, you know, that's in the short run. You know, in the next month, I mean, if reality on the ground will be reality, and that's that's just it. I, I, what happens after that, though, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, in the end, all these economic sanctions have to go away because, you know, um, I think you guys as Europeans are going to start pressuring your own governments that you don't want $10 a liter gasoline. You know, you don't want heating bills that are 200% higher than what they used to be. Yeah. Uh I mean, there isn't too much that I can add that has been already said about Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine and Russia and all of this conflict. The only thing I, I, I want to say is that really this, this war and the devastation is really going to be limited by one factor. And that factor is the hubris of the West, the arrogance of the West. These people, the global American empire, the American moralizers, as the Z-man called them, they... Uh, they want to run the world, and they have had hegemony in the last couple of decades. Um, and they, it's, it's really a question of how easily or how difficult is it going to be for them to let go of that fantasy. And that's why they're so, that's why they're so unwilling to do it, because when they legitimize all this, when they say, yes, this is now Russia, yes, uh, the Ukraine lost, yes, there will not be a, a Soros gay government in, in the Ukraine, that really, you know, may become the kind of uh, a start of a new era, a... Uh, uh, it, the camel's back is, is going to break because ultimately they will have to concede. When was the last time you saw, um, you know, the American moralizers concede on anything? They double down every single time on every single scenario. And the vast majority of these scenarios are not even dictate, dictated by the interest of the United States. They are dictated by the, as I have said, by the pure hubris of the current leadership of the United States who think they can rule the world. And all, and that is unsustainable. Ultimately, that is yeah, unsustainable. It, 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 it's, 
You know, I mean, look, you know, Augustus realized that, that the Roman Empire could, could no longer expand to the east. You know, and, you know, even the, so even the Romans came to a point which, you know, they realized there was a limit. And it, it doesn't seem to be a part of the uh, thinking. And, and look, American foreign policy has largely been taken control of by a very narrow group of, of uh, lunatics, really. They're the neoconservatives. Uh, these are evil people. Uh, they they persist whether they're it doesn't matter which political party is in, in power. Uh, they were largely behind getting Donald Trump out of the White House and debilitating his presidency. And you know Trump was his own worst enemy in a lot of ways. But uh, these people engineered these things. Uh, you know what, what, the way it works is that you know one group is in power in all these positions in the uh, foreign policy establishment during one administration. Well, then you get the next party comes in. So those guys leave, but then their friends who are sitting out at some think tank somewhere or some corporately funded uh, uh, academics uh, uh, chair, they come back in. So, so nothing ever changes. It's always the same people. And what they finally got is Joe Biden, who is uh, a, a doddering old man who's incapable of thinking for himself. I mean, it's a sad thing. This is this is uh, elder abuse, what's going on. And the vice president is, is just dumb as a goldfish. I mean, this woman is just entirely unskilled. And so they're they're running wild, and and you know there, there's a um, uh, there's an article uh, kicking around where uh, 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 Nile Ferguson, I think it is. I'd have to look it up, but um, I'm actually going to. I sent off my tacky column on Monday. I have a link to it there. But um, he overheard, or he passes a rumor on that the Secretary of State is telling people in, in NATO that what they're going to do, that what the plan is, is to bleed Russia dry into Ukraine. And then have regime change in Moscow, and then use that to then have regime change in Beijing. The <laughs> usual, like, the usual. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh. and and it, what's wild about this to me is it's so obvious that the Russians have learned a lot. They learned a lot from watching the Americans conduct war Syria. in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, and and how we've done your regime change. I mean, look, they tried to pull. We tried to uh, regime change Belarus, and that went nowhere. <laughs> Because the Russians learned. I mean, they 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 figured this out, and uh, you know, it's it's and and what's even crazier is that you're putting javelin missiles, right, anti tank weapons, mm -hmm. into you're flooding these things in there. And of course, there's a British version. Is you know, everybody's got their own own thing. Mm -hmm. Well, immediately they're being we we know this is true. They're, they're they're being grabbed and put onto the black market. Well, well, how long before one of these hits a motorcade in Berlin or in Paris? You know. Uh, how long before a uh, uh, a man pad, you know, these uh, shoulder-fired surface-to-air missiles? How, how long before one of those takes out a, uh, a an airliner and watch them? Because, I mean, you, you're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of these things. And they're just pouring this equipment into into Ukraine. I, I mean, this is lunacy. I mean, people are it's going to cause real harm. I mean, because let's face it, the first time that a surface-to-air missile takes out a commercial airliner, all airline travel stops. You know, the world suddenly stops. I mean, even cargo flights stop. I mean, I, I, I do fear that, you know, I would feel a lot better about the future, uh, immediate future with regards to Ukraine, if Joe Biden was in the third year of his term and he would most likely be voted out because there would be some chance of some, some sanity coming in. But, you know, I, I don't see any change on the Washington side. So, I, you know, it's it's terrifying, really, because, I mean, you're having people in Washington actually talk about limited use of nuclear weapons. I mean, that's I've, that's madness. Wow. I mean, for somebody my age, particularly, you know, we when I was a kid, we were regularly shown, I, this is all throughout my, my schooling, and I think actually it was required, you sat and you watched videos of what it would be like if there was a real nuclear war. In other words, we were being trained to say, no, we're never going to ever do anything that leads to nuclear war. You know, that we're, <laughs> we're, this is, this is the, you know, it's, it can never happen, it can never be allowed to happen. And so for someone my age to see that, I mean, it's just, it's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's the one thing that actually worries me. It actually has me thinking about moving to some very rural place <laughs> where <laughs> maybe I have some, some chance of surviving. Yeah, um, uh, just a, a quick update, guys. I think we'll be running for m maximum the next 20 minutes or so. So this would be the time to send in your uh, your donations, your questions via the link in the description if you have any uh, more of those. I wanted to uh, kind of m move away from... Um, uh, from the Ukraine, and maybe perhaps it has links with the Ukraine and this uh, whole imperialism uh, deal. But what is your um, what is your view on colonialism? I I think I, I seem to remember uh, you 
uh, mentioning Charles de Gaulle, I believe, in one of your recent uh, essays, and uh, you spoke about how colonialism is really not uh, is 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 bad because it's not beneficial. Ultimately, it may be superficially uh, or technologically beneficial to you know the people who are being colonized, but ultimately the government is not working in their interest, and therefore uh, colonialism is uh, you know is not uh, productive. Um, can you elaborate on that? Do uh, do you do you think that colonialism ultimately is an uh, an evil or an impractical thing? What is your view on that? say it's evil. I mean, I, I, I think, I, I guess, you know, all those years in Catholic school, I tend to reserve the word evil for things that are, uh, you know, for the extremes. But I, I think if colonialism, you know, I, I mean, again, again, there's a lot of ways to define that, but, you know, a, a European country mm-hmm. t- taking taking ter- territory in Africa and say, well, this is ours now, we're going to manage this, and you native people, well, you're not really going to get much of a say in how things are done. Well, that can be very good for those people. Resources come in, uh, uh, especially human capital, learning, building roads, uh, water supplies, you know, electricity, you know, all that stuff. That's all good. But th- at some point in every human society, the, the choices have to be made. You know, trade-offs have to be decided. And ultimately, who decides and how those things are decided is what matters to everybody in their society. I mean, we care about that. It's an important part of what defines us as human beings, whether we're loincloth wearing Africans or we're, uh, uh, you know, uh, sophisticated Europeans. We care about that. It's just, it's something we can't break free of. And, you know, having some stranger decide on your behalf is never going to feel right. It's always going to feel wrong. And of course, the people who are actually making the decisions are always inevitably going to decide on their benefit, you know? And, And so you get this accumulation of decisions that are made, that are perceived by one side as being made by people who are strangers and against their interest and by the other side as being necessary and increasingly to protect their interest from this increasingly hostile native population. You know, you just, it just starts spiraling along. So, you know, I think, um, you know, the reality of, of, of conquering another people, I mean, look, the, the ancients had it right. You know, when you conquer another people, you take their women and you impregnate them so their children become you and you sell their men off into slavery or you kill them. I mean, that's just the way it is. You just get rid of them. I mean, that's, that's you know, it's terrible. It's genocide. But, you know, to, to actually maintain your, your dominion over, over a conquered people, that's, that's expensive and difficult. I mean, you know, back, you go back even further, you know, um, was it the Persians? Well, gosh, maybe before that. You know, they, you know back in the, the early, early days, you know, that they would, uh, they would conquer another people and they would remove their gods. They'd take their totem away and say, all right, you know, you, you, now, you now we're taking this, your identity away as a, as a way to try and control the population. But it's, it's just very expensive. And, um, and I think, you know, ultimately self-defeating. I mean, look, that's the story of, of, um, of, of, of uh, you know, colonialism in, uh, in, in uh, the Western hemisphere. You know, eventually it just became too expensive for the British to maintain the English colonies. It, it was the point. I mean, so think about it. I mean, did Britain really suffer at all when America broke off and became independent? Not really. You know, a couple of years, sure. But by the time you get to the middle of the 19th century, yeah, it was actually a net benefit to both sides. So do you think it was, uh, do you think the fact that ultimately, historically speaking, that uh, the United States was formed and, and has broken away from uh, from Britain, that was a good thing? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, good and bad, I mean, these are moral terms. I mean, I think... Yeah, I think it was inevitable. Historically I beneficial. Think, uh, can I alter my kind of, you know, ultimately beneficial to that territory? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I think there's a, I think ultimately in the end, we'll say that the English colonizing the new world and then this evolutionary process going along was a net benefit to all of mankind. Um, well, uh, you know, all of mankind will be richer, healthier, genuinely happier, but it's not without trade-offs. There's going to be bad sides. I mean, the, the global American empire has done a lot of good, but it, it's, it's run its course. It's time is up. It's expiry date is here. And of course, it, you know, the people in charge can't see it that way. So there's going to be a very painful and difficult period. But in the total, we'll, we'll say that, yeah, it was a net benefit, much the same way as the British empire is, is a net benefit. You know, the, you know, there's a billion Indians who benefited from the British empire. Um, you know, so I mean, I, I, I guess I, I don't. I'm a, It's funny, even though I'm an American, I'm very anti-moralizer. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> history just, you know, history just is. You know, it just is, 
And, and uh, it is no question that you and I live better lives than people a century ago. Uh, it, materially, uh, we live better lives. Do we live better lives spiritually? Probably not. Um, and, and that's, that's part of the cost of that, but maybe there's some middle ground there that we're going to come and kind of come back to where we get to have the kind of spiritual lives, the kind of community lives that are fulfilling and satisfying, but also have most of the material things that also make, make life, you know, good too. I mean, let's face it, this is a neat thing that we can do. We can be what five time zones, four time zones away. And, um, so, you know, it's not all bad, yeah, you know, yeah. it, it, the American empire wasn't all bad is it's a trade, a set of trade-offs. And I think we're, that's what we're really, what we're, we're seeing right now is the bill is coming due for a lot of things that yes. should have gone away a long time ago. Yes. The, um, it's about time that we pay for the excesses of the last few centuries. That is, that is what it feels like. And I agree with you. I mean, ultimately, you know, I might sound like I want to, and you know, I talk about the 12th century and I, you know, <laughs> I want to destroy all the skyscrapers, turn off the internet and, uh, you know, basically uh, put all the peasants back on the on the farmland and everything but the thing is I, I we realize we must realize that we are also modern men and this is you know modernity in one way or another has shaped us you know biologically philosophically even if we, we try to resist this we try to resist the excesses and that's going to be key I think in any future right-wing dissident movement anywhere be it America or be it the US and that's why oh sorry it'll be the US be it the uh, be it Europe um, um, and that's why I I like um, I like the Groper movement and I like Nic Nicolas J. Puentes and the reason is is that we must realize that uh, we will have to make compromises. We will still have to live in a modern world of technology. But what limits on that technology uh, are we going to put? What limits on corporations? What limits on modernity? Ultimately, we're going to have to put so that we don't kill ourselves so that we as a civilization just don't hang ourselves as the result of all these excesses and in terms of uh, colonialism i have kind of a more of probably eurocentric realpolitik view of that i think ultimately it was i mean you know we we came to a lot and a lot of that land was it was just i mean empty and not impressive at all culturally or architecturally technologically and they have benefited not just uh, materially, but spiritually. I mean, Christianity, I believe Christianity is the truth and the way. And therefore, uh, I credit colonialism with the save, uh, this, uh, saving of a lot of souls of the indigenous. So I kind of have a realpolitik, Eurocentric um, vision of colonialism. I, I don't want to, this is, we can go on to, you know, to discuss this for a long time. But because we're running short on it, I, I just want to... Uh, go to the super chat and, and read off some of the questions. Um, uh, Fadisha tipped us and said, great guest, please have him back. I'll try. Um, at some point, maybe a month or two, or, or at some point I would like to have you back, Z-Man, because uh, this has been really great and fascinating. Oh yeah, this is a good conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I've enjoyed myself anytime. Um, uh, then we have Topic Sentence also tipped the stream, so thank you very much. Can Trump win in 2024? Should we support him? What a question. Uh, I don't know. I don't really know how I feel about it. I mean, I guess my view politics, uh, it's, it's a means to an end for me. And if, if I voted for Donald Trump in 2016, I didn't vote in 2012. I voted for Donald Trump in 2016 out of spite. I said that and I stood in line with a whole bunch of other people. And we all said the same thing. We're voting, voting for out of spite. And this is an area that typically would never vote for a Republican. And uh, I was amazed at how many people were there. They just said, enough. You know, we're, we'll, I hope he destroys it all. I mean, burn it down, you know. And that, I might feel that way in 2024. I don't know. I mean, I mean maybe that's necessary. But I, I think we're probably going to need, I, my guess is, is that Trump's going to be, he's either going to have to transform himself into something completely different, or he's going to be surprised that the general tone of the public is going to be for someone who's much more serious and much more willing to do uh, the things that need to be done, uh, or at least perceived to be that way. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's going to be a different mood. You know, look, 2016, life was pretty good in America. But, you know, two years of those COVID stuff, and now we got energy prices uh, that are through the roof. And, uh, I mean, people, there's real suffering now. We're seeing people, you know, we have food shortages. We're, we're you know, we're, this is, this, it's, things are getting serious. And um, so Trump, you know, with his one-liners might not be appropriate for the for the mood of the country. I know it's going to be interesting to see because you know the thing about it is that the guy has got a weird way of understanding this too. 
so he could wind up kind of reforming himself into a completely different candidate. So it'd be interesting to watch. Yeah, for sure. I think that uh, the unfortunate part is that, and that's sort of a groundbreaking take. I just, this is the way I feel is Trump has been DCified, if you will. He's been turned into, he's been scared out of his own self, really. You know, you look at him and uh, you look at him on the campaign trail, the things that he was saying, and uh, he was so confident in his message. And then you look at what happens after he's had, you know, a couple, a couple of chats with a, with a couple of uh, questionable people, and it just all turns out. And the best that the best I can describe how disappointing the Trump presidency was is via a quote of his, which is, "We're monitoring the situation." I mean, this is really for me sums up the whole Trump thing. It was so exciting. I mean, Trump really it was kind of at the origins of of uh, my political involvement. Really, just like uh, you know, I'm the same age as Nicholas J. Fuentes, and I was also a libertarian during my time at at, at school. And really, Trump energized me and, and pushed me into that dissident direction. Uh, and it was a very exciting time. Even in Europe, we we looked at this election, and it all coincided with Brexit. It was an exciting time, a time of change. But then he was ultimately. Trump was subverted ultimately, and and it really, really, uh, kind of thrown, uh, thrown my doubt. I, I, I doubt that Trump right now can really provide the same kind of energy and the same uh, kind of can generate the same kind of protest that we would require to push distant right wing politics forward. At the same time, he remains that. He remains that kind of historical backbone figure of uh, of dissident right wing politics, and uh, you know perhaps we have no other choice. Perhaps Americans have no other choice uh, but but Trump in twenty twenty four if he chooses to run, which I would think that he would. Um, it, it could be. It's one of those things. I mean, the guy, um, you know, he could look around and say because one of the things he really, you know, he he figured out how to take the temperature of the voters while he was campaigning. It was a very interesting s- trick that he pulled. He, he would throw out all these things he would say, and and whichever one's got the biggest cry, la- uh, cheers, the, that became his policy. I mean, yep. that's, that's really how, <laughs> what he was up to. And I can see this happening again, that him, uh, all of a sudden, he's going to be running in 2024 as an isolationist, you know, get, yep, yep, yep. pull America out of Europe or something. You know. But uh, my problem is, is that I, I was shocked and I still, in a way, am shocked at how someone who is, he's, look, he's a smart man, there's no getting around that, and he's been engaged in politics for a long time, just how little he knew about Washington politics and how it really worked. I mean, he just made one amateur mistake after another, and it really is quite shocking. And uh, I, I, it, it's one of those times where we, you know, we all, we all uh, uh, mistake linguistic skill for intelligence. You know, yeah. it, it, a lot of times, you know, and I mean, we all, I mean, I, I do this as well. And I think that very well been with Trump. He's intelligent, he's wily, and he's clever, but there's areas in which he's really quite dumb. And I think it turned out to be um, being president was he was really dumb at. <laughs> he wasn't very good at that at all. Um, but uh, you know, but then on the other hand, though, you know, there there could be you know American presidents are really vehicles. They're like uh, platforms. Yeah. And, and you know, and and that maybe there might be people who are who are really afraid of what's going on. Who say you know what we're gonna we're gonna get into this guy's campaign? We're actually going to use him as you know our skin suit to get into Washington and push through some necessary reform. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes because you know when I was a young guy, this happened in the '70s and '80s. I mean, I was a little kid, but the '70s was a disaster in America. Aesthetically, it was disgusting. Uh, you know, uh, the economy was terrible. The, the the tone of the country was awful. I mean. When the when the U.S. hockey team, I, I tell the story all the time. When the U.S. hockey team beat the the Soviets in 1980, it changed people's attitudes. I, my, <laughs> my father never really watched hockey, and he just looked at me and said, "I can't believe we beat the Russians because people really thought we were losing. We were going to lose the Cold War. It was it was over for America." And it suddenly, little events like that turned people's attitudes. But it was a different country then, and uh, I don't know if we're capable of doing that. I mean, you know, so I, I think there is a lot of people, though, who are looking around, th- who are powerful people, who are very afraid of what's going on. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes with Trump. I, I honestly, if I had to bet right now, I'd say it'd be a lot better if he's if he didn't run. But I don't know. I'm 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 not really I, I'm I'm really good at predicting the future like that. Whom do you like to see from the current political figures running for Republican office? 
Yeah, see, that's the problem. I can't really think of any of them that I, I care mm -hmm. for. Yeah. Uh, Ron DeSantis is a sober-minded guy. He's very smart. He's a very wily politician, but he's an Israel first guy. Uh, um, yeah, exactly. We and, can't uh, escape that even with more. Trump at this point. Yeah, it, it's, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I say this rather clearly I'm joking, but you know, it, it wouldn't. It would be great if the Iranians nuked the, the Israelis, because then maybe we would get this over with. We'd be done, you know. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I mean, it's just it's just terrible. But um, I, I mean, that's actually kind of fun. So I'm kind of hoping is that the Biden people seem to be thinking on the Israelis with this Iran deal. The Saudis are upset about it, and uh, it wouldn't break my heart if the Israelis said, "Well, you know what? We're going to partner with China now." And so uh, all of a sudden, all the executive suites around Washington will empty out as they all head over to Beijing. <laughs> That's sort of my <laughs> fantasy. Uh, but uh, I don't think that'll happen. But yeah, I don't know. I really can't think of anybody. I, I, odds are, I, I was going to sound crazy, but it might actually turn out that the best remedy for America will be someone who's a genuine leftist. You know, not, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, some, you know, because... Yeah, you know, there's the old expression, you know, like uh, back when I was a kid, that you know, only Nixon could go to China. In other words, somebody who had his credentials with regards to communism could strike a deal with the communists. Well, I, I, I wonder if there isn't someone that will need somebody from the far left of America to wind up winning, look around and say, I got to change everything. And, and, and he'll have the credibility ready to do it. I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, that's that's I otherwise honestly I'm I'm not really too optimistic in the short run in terms of politics I think we might have a um, I've compared us to the uh, Soviet Union in the 70s we had Brezhnev stuck around too long and then it was a series of guys uh, Chernenkov and I forget the other guy Indropov and and then finally you had um, uh, what's his name the guy with the, um, the the weird birthmark on his forehead. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you know, that, I mean, I think that's where we're in that kind of period now where we just have a, we don't have a bench. There's nobody, there's nobody good. They're all bums. Yeah. Yeltsin. And yeah. Um, so ring bearer tipped us also. And he said, Z-Man, I myself did not grow up religiously. And I understand that you aren't a religious man yourself. Forgive me if that's a mischaracterization. Christianity is central to the Groyper movement. How do you integrate these two? Uh, I'm in a similar state. Well, I, I'm not, it, it's one of those things. I, I'm not a religious guy, but I'm not an atheist either. I, I just, um, I, I think if I, if, if I had uh, children, I would be at church every Sunday and they would be participating in, you know, the youthful activities of the church because I think that would be necessary for them. But uh, I, I'm not, I don't have a family. So, you know, me participating in the community of the church is Probably, uh, probably the, it just doesn't have a strong appeal to me. <laughs> Although, who knows? I, I, my my opinion could change. Uh, the other problem is, is that where I've lived in the past, the Catholic churches have been run by goofballs. Uh, the last time I went to mass, they had guitars and banjos and stuff Ugh. like that. And yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, I, I you know, and if if there was a, a place I could go to Latin mass close by, that would be a different story. But. Yeah. Um, but I, I think, uh, heck, I'd probably even go to an Orthodox church. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of church uh, architecture, and uh, yes. so I've been all over Europe taking pictures of churches. And, uh, you know, I could see, even though I'm not, I probably would, would struggle a little bit with the Orthodox faith, eh, I could make it work. But, um, yeah, look, I think, I think in a lot of ways with the Groypers, their religiosity is more, it's more of a, it, it's, it's symbolic. I guess it's it's a, almost it's it's a marker they're putting out there and saying, look, if you want to be in our thing, you can't be irreligious or opposed to Christianity. And and I, and I think you know Christianity for them is much more of a in a symbolic sense because a lot of the things they talk about with terms of religion are a little goofy. I'll be honest with you, um, you know, you, you a Catholic saying Christ is King, well. I mean, my grandmother would have a stroke if she had been alive to hear something like that. That's just not how Catholics act. You know, <laughs> you, just, you don't do that in public. That's how Zoomers um, act, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I think a lot of it is is performative in a sense, and, and, and that's okay. I mean, I, I'm okay with that. I mean, it doesn't bother me. Uh, you know, politics is a lot about symbolism. And, uh, and I, look, I've met a lot of these guys. I think some of them are very religious. I think so, most are probably where I am, and that is I'm not hostile to religion for sure. But, you know, I, I, it, I don't participate in a, in a church at the moment, but I wouldn't be opposed to doing it. I think that's probably where most of them are. So I, I think 
you shouldn't allow a religion to scare you off. And then the other thing is too, people who haven't grown up in around religion often have really crazy ideas about what it's really like. Yeah. yeah. And instead, you know, you, you know, your church is just, it's just a bunch of, it's a place where people go and it's a community. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's no, there's not, there's nothing, you know, weird going on there. There's no animal sacrifice. I mean, actually it'd be kind of cool if we had, a, you know, animal sacrifice again, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it shouldn't be put off by it. And I, look, I've gone to Zoomer events and, uh, here in, in the States and, uh, they're a good time. They're a lot of fun. Um, you know, the, the conversation flows, it, it's real, it's, it's good old fashioned fellowship. And, uh, yep. and that's why I enjoy it. You know, especially again, as an old guy who this, this kind of thing was really not something that happened for my generation when I was younger, other than the Buchanan run and that came to an end. And, uh, so it's, um, it's a good thing if you're, if you're here in the States and you can go to a Zoomer event, you should go to a Zoomer event, you know, Fuentes, he travels all over the damn place doing these things. So you can find him somewhere. Yeah, and uh, uh, if you don't mind, I mean, this question is uh, attributed to you, the one that you've just answered, but if, if I can just give my quick uh, two cents. Sure. Um, look, guys, from a practical point of view, we, we know what's going on. What, what is the problem? What is the main heresy? What is the main problem that we are facing as a society right now from which everything else originates? I pose that it's modernity. That's what it is. And so... Uh, People are lost. People do not have an identity. And so we just need to healthily, uh, we need to healthily look at our history and look at our roots and look at what our ancestors did. And they have died for the cross. They have built Christian empires for, you know, more than a thousand years. You know, we had Christendom. This is us. We are Christians. Ultimately, Europeans and Christians are really the same thing. It has become that way. It hasn't been that way for a long time, but the European identity is a Christian identity. There are churches, albeit they're being, you know, they're being destroyed now and burnt and everything. But uh, that is ultimately the European um, identity. And so we have these churches, we have this theology, we have uh, these traditions, these customs, they define us. This is our natural uh, identity, as I have said. So therefore, that's what we need to foster. This is the identity that we need to foster and we need to promote and we need to look into. Because nothing synthetic, no, no, synth no synthetic new paganism or whatever is going to save us. No, we live in a paganistic society. We do. With these excesses that we uh, encounter on a day to day. I know some people don't like, you know, me pointing this out or my opinion on this. We live in an excessive paganistic society, or we have these idols that we worship. I mean, ultimately, we are a Christian society, and we need to act like it. And the only credibility, uh, has, I believe, that you know, you, the only credibility, the only Christian church that has credibility, has traditionally been not post-Vatican II, of course, but has traditionally been the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, that is the Church of the West. And so you really need to, in rediscovering our identity, we really need to look, in my opinion, towards Christianity. And that's just how it has to be, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, uh, how I would, you know, what, you know, subjects like this, I always think about, you know, how would I talk to someone who is not a religious person, who has no experience with religion? And, you know, I would, I would start by saying, look, what religion is about is a set of rules. And it, what, what those rules are about is who we are. This is a fundamental of society. You know, the, one of the, f the first things of any kind of society, whether you, you're getting a group of people to pick up litter in a park or uh, get the school painted or whatever it is, the first thing you say is, who are we? What's the point of us all getting together as one group? And as soon as you say that, the next thing that has to happen is, all right, what are the rules that define us? You know, this, we, we, we are people who do these things and we don't do these things. Well, if we're going to take and apply this this logic to our, our re, re, you know, rediscovering our, our Western traditions and our Western society, well, it means we have to go and pull all those old rules back and say, well, okay, these were the rules that we used. And a big part of that was, in fact, religion, particularly the Catholic Church. And so you had these rules and it said, well, you, you had to do these things in order to stay in good standing. And if you wanted to become a part of this community, you had to do these things, meet these qualifications. And when you start thinking of it that way, it's a lot easier, I think, to 
to uh, get non-religious people nodding along because now they understand, okay, yeah, I, I might not be sure about my faith or whether I believe in God or not or whatever, but I like the rules. The rules are good. <laughs> and, you know, I, <laughs> yeah. I, would, I would rather, you know, one of the worst expressions in human history is someone saying, I'm spiritual, not religious. No, I want you to be religious. Yes. I don't give a damn if you're spiritual. Yes. That's, that's, it's so funny that you mentioned this, Iman, because uh, one of my friends has been uh, atheistic for a long time. He's been ever since I've known him since school, and he was an atheist, and, and very, very fervent at that as well. And recently, I was able to kind of nudge him. I mean, look, he became a, Luth a Lutheran, not quite a Catholic. Look, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying my best. <laughs> bit by bit, we'll get to the truth, we'll get to the SSPX. But in any case, um, and what he said, I asked him, like, so what is it that, that kind of, after all this time of militant atheism, what has led you to this? And he said, it's actually something that you said, uh, uh, referring to me. He said, um, uh, uh, he said, you said that effectively look at the practicality of Christianity, practically what has achieved, uh, what has it achieved. Forget about all this like theology, forget about all the abstract questions that, you know, theologians and philosophers and politicians like to talk about and podcasters like to talk about and, and get back to the practicalities. We have established Christian empires. We have established a natural hierarchy, uh, you know, of the church, the secular kings and uh, the aristocracy and, and the people. It is a natural way of life. And we, the Christian Christian empires of all sorts have effectively, at some point or another, have taken over the whole world. And so Christianity, even though it's on the downturn now with the Protestantization, if that's, that's even a word, of the Catholic Church, still it is we have access to our tradition, we have a chance of restoring that tradition, and it, it will never go away anywhere. Our Christian heritage will never go away anywhere, and that's because we have practically embedded it into our society, and it really contributed, uh, I be really believe that, that Christianity has contributed to this, um, uh, to how, you know, prosperous and how glorious and how culturally advanced Europe has ended up being. And the fact that we're in a downturn now does not change that in the least. So, yeah, I mean, you know, and I said that, you know, the church Hellenized Europe, but, you know, the truth is, too, is that Europe Europeanized this religion that we exactly. now call Christianity. You know, so it was a back and forth. And, and I, I think, too, look, we're, pro we're never going to go back to uh, uh, the Catholicism of the 12th century. But that we don't have to, because yeah. the people in the 12th century could always look around and say, well, we can make this better. What we really need to think about is that, well, how do we get back on track? You know, Western societies are basically like a, a car that went off the road to the point where you can't see <laughs> the road anymore. Yeah. You know, and now, now we just have to get back on the road again. And, and I mean, it means that you know, religion will be different. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, again, not, I'm most familiar with the Catholic traditions, of course, but... Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't. I'm not upset when I hear people, particularly Catholics in the United States, who are m migrating to uh, Orthodox churches, mm -hmm. and you know they're probably the only churches having a, a growth. Well, okay. I mean, it's close enough. I mean, I you know it's <laughs> you know we don't have to we don't have to have arguments about it. We we figured out all those differences. If someone says I want to be a Lutheran, okay, you know you're you're almost there. You know, I mean, you'll have to spend some time in purgatory, but you know, it, it's, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it that's it and my position has always been on this christian stuff is that now is the time that the way the conversation should be going now is restoring europe and the west in general to christianity if we want to have conversations later on once we've established that we are a christian civilization at our heart then we can have these conversations about restoring catholicism uh talking about orthodoxy and and what we can do to unify the west uh, East schism, we can talk about Protestantism, but right now that conversation is not that useful politically speaking because we haven't passed the hurdle of actually saying that Christ has died and risen. We haven't gotten to that over that hurdle yet. So we need to go over that first and then we can talk about the difference between Catholicism, the, the good old debates between you know, Catholicism and Protestantism and Orthodoxy and so on. So We've already, I apologize for that, we've run a bit of, uh, over over the time limit that you've set, so I apologize for that, but um, if you have any closing thoughts, um, let's hear them and then uh, we'll wrap up. 
Well, uh, first of all, it was a, it's been a very good conversation. You know, it's, uh, I have to admit that sometimes I'm really kind of terrible at these things, but a lot <laughs> of it has to do with how well you hit it off with someone. And, and we are of similar mind on, on things, but from a different, uh, not only, uh, uh, you know, two different countries, but also two different generations too. And then, so it's been a fun conversation. I think, I hope people have enjoyed it. Well, although, strangely enough, m almost no one who follows me will sit in front of a live stream, but they'll come back and listen to it later. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> I, I, it's, I, and I, you know, I, it's one of those things that, uh, I, I mean, it's not a bad thing, but it, it uh, unfortunately, um, uh, you don't get as many questions, I guess. So, but that's okay. You know, one of the things about building up these channels, I knew, um, uh, well, there, God, what the heck was his name? Um, oh, God, I had slip my mind, but that doesn't matter. You know, yeah, you always have to start small with these things. When I first did my um, my podcast, I think I had like a hundred listeners, and you know, it just kept building up. The other day, I looked at it, and it the, the statistics that I can get, and it was well over fifty thousand. I'm like, you know, how did this happen? How did you know? How, how did this happen? Well, it's because every Friday I do a podcast. You know, and eventually, you know, people just kind of get in the habit of listening. So, uh, so I think you know what you're your as far as how you're going about trying to build your channel, get people on, and have good conversations. That's a that's that's the way to do it. You know, it's it's the kind of content that we need more of because I I think the real strength of our movement, if if you want to use that term, is that we're a lot of smart people, practical people, and we're not asking for a lot. We're not we're not radicals. We're, yeah. we're prudent, reasonable people. And the more people get an opportunity to listen to. Uh, you know, people like us having a conversation, they're not along and say, yeah, these, there's nothing unreasonable about these guys. And that, and that leads them to say, that, well, wait a second, that means there's nothing unreasonable about me. And that, <laughs> that's, that's what, really what this is all about. So, so I had a good time. I, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not upset that we've run a little long, I, although I do have to cut it off here because uh, I do have some things to, to, to do today because it's um, almost two o'clock here on the East Coast. Well, thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks for, uh, you know, sending us a few tips. Your questions were very much appreciated. And finally, I would like to take the Z-Man from, uh, to thank the Z-Man from the Z-Man blog, which you can obviously find, as most of you will know, at uh, thezman.com. I'd like to thank you for coming on, and it's been a fascinating conversation.